I think this is the battleground culture issue in America today. How is it that we can trust an organization for whom abortion is such an important part of their business model to simultaneously effectively prevent pregnancy and prevent abortion? The problem in America today is that people simply change the topic. The key to successfully talking about abortion is to try to bring the conversation back to one key question. When you're an obstetrician gynecologist and you're pro-choice, you have to decide whether you're actually going to do those abortions. I felt this fierce protectiveness just like rise up inside me because I knew the way that the world was gonna see him. I believe that being pro-life is the most progressive value that we can have. The abortion industry is most threatened by Christians engaging in pro-life work. Finding that pregnancy center was the only person I had to support me at that time. We need to show the world that number one on our list is our interest in serving these moms. She's got to know when she takes that pregnancy test that her church is not going to try to treat her like the Pharisees tried to treat the woman caught in adultery. As the church, we can't just vote pro-life. We have to be pro-love. Hey guys, welcome to another Motion University live stream. We're super excited to have you with us here this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're at uh, in the country. Um, but yeah, we're excited to be talking today to Tracy Robinson, and we're going to be talking kind of a little bit about kind of behind the scenes of her project, um, a new feature documentary that's going to be coming out or is releasing. We're going to kind of learn more about that uh, here today. Um, but before we get started, just want to remind you, you can leave any questions or comments in the chat um, and we'd be happy to answer those live with you guys. Um, also, if you're just joining us for the first time, we always love to have you guys subscribe so that you can get some more of these. Um, we try to do them at least once a month um, and we're kind of looking to kind of flesh out kind of our, our streaming schedule and we always are interested to hear what things you guys want to hear about. So uh, feel free to leave those things in the comments. Um, but yeah, so with that, um, I would love to introduce you guys to um, kind of a little bit what we're talking about. So I know we showed the trailer there at the beginning for those of you who jumped in right at the beginning of the stream. Um, so yeah, so Tracy, we actually, um, I think we first met her at the Christian Worldview Film Festival, I want to say it was last year. Um, last year. Yeah, and then uh, we actually were able to work with her on a documentary project that we were doing. She came on as an editor, so that was super cool. Um, but Tracy, welcome to the stream. And uh, yeah, if you want to just you. give everybody a little introduction to who you are and what you do. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. I am a video editor first and foremost, but I uh, went, I got inspired to do a documentary several, several years ago, and it finally came to fruition this year. And uh, it's a documentary with a purpose and a message. And so it's been a grassroots effort this year, uh, releasing it slowly but surely to various groups and audiences. We just had a premiere this past, uh, a couple weeks ago that really was a event that really launched it. And uh, it's just really super exciting to have it finally come to fruition. Uh, the, the film itself is a tool that equips people to understand the abortion issue uh, from a lot of different angles uh, and sides. Um, the science, the philosophy, the history, and powerful personal stories. And it's really been well received so far. A, lo a lot of people's hearts and minds are changing because of it. And it's just, people are really responsive to it. So, um, yeah. That's that's fantastic. I'm, I'm guessing the poster behind you might have something to do. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, that was at the premiere. We had some signs in the at the event pointing people in the right direction so i thought that'd be funny to just hang it up on the wall so. <laughs> and, <laughs> and by the way for those guys tuning in uh, J jc's here too uh, i forgot to uh, mention that uh, so hi jc glad you're here hey. too so jc's going to be kind of um doing kind of the quote-unquote interview this is we're not this is a little bit more of just a kind of behind the scenes look and those kind of things and i'll be moderating some of the, the comments um and and that kind of thing so uh yeah with that jc <clears throat> i'll let you take it over i'm going to jump in the chat and uh yeah, I'll be, I'll be hanging out back here. Well, as with any project, um, it's, it's, it's one thing to start. 
it's one thing to get into the middle and be wishing for the end is another thing to get to the end. So first of all, round of applause, which is a cue sound Thank effect. You. Round of applause <laughs> for completion, for having a premiere and, and getting a film started all the way to finished. That's, that's a huge, it's yeah. a huge undertaking, um, whether it's narrative, whether it's short, whether it's documentary, um, well done, well done, congratulations. So uh, that, that's huge. Um, yeah, so maybe, maybe take us back to how you were saying a couple of years ago you kind of got inspired to to make this project. Mm -hmm. How did how did the how did the idea start? We'll start there. Okay. So I I've, I've been in the film production world for over a decade now, and I a little background on me. I graduated film school, sort of an outdated degree now in film and video production. I graduated in two thousand and eight. And then eventually became a documentary video editor, like full time for about about almost four years, I guess, cutting my teeth while I was cutting documentaries, just eight hours a day editing documentaries, do documentary co uh, content for a company I was with. And uh, then I left that company to do my own thing. I started what's called Mercy Tree Media, <laughs> uh, which I don't use. I don't. I only use that to edit now, but. Um, I started to do promo videos for nonprofits and ministries and things like this that I, it, and it really began word of mouth. And um, one of the clients I had was a pregnancy center. Uh, I had volunteer video edited or video produced for them for quite a, for a few years and uh, just started ramping up their content, started to do more uh, other organizations. And so um, I was invited, how the film started was that I was invited by my friends at the pregnancy center, by my clients at the pregnancy center to an apologetics night, a speaking event where uh, the topic being presented was the case against abortion. And even though I was filming videos uh, for a pregnancy, re a pro-life pregnancy resource center. I wasn't really that pro-life. I was pretty much on the fence about the issue, pretty apathetic. Like it didn't really interest me that much. And I, at best I was personally pro-life, but didn't really give it that much thought beyond that. And when I heard this message presented by Alan Schleeman of Stand to Reason, he gave a clear, concise, case for the full humanity of the unborn child from the moment of conception. And it just struck me. Uh, and, and then what struck me even more was that it was so easy to tell this message, to give this information without needing like Bible. You didn't have to be r religious to believe in this, that uh, the unborn child is a human and, or a person from the moment of conce conception. And I, was struck with the fact that nobody had told me this information before. And I knew there were so many people in my shoes that need, deserved to hear the truth. And so the documentary idea was pretty much downloaded to me in that moment of hearing the message. I was like, as a, you know, as a filmmaker, I guess, I just, it just happened. <laughs> it just occurred. I'm like, this needs to happen. Yeah. And uh, I had never, made a feature documentary before and I and I said how hard could this be so that was five <laughs> years <laughs> right so, uh, that's a great that start was... how hard could this be yeah did yeah, you ever consider was... narrative at all or did you was documentary did you know that was the way you wanted to go and why yeah I I always loved narrative I always felt like I was a writer and just very imaginative and uh, thought of stories and things like this but um, documentary is really also a love of mine. So I just knew that I could do it. You know, I just felt, felt like, yeah, that's, this is, this needs to happen. And I think I can figure out how it could happen, you know? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I kind of love both, but I, I feel like there's more power to me with documentaries. Right. Right. Sure. Well, that's, that's a really cool story that it's a that there's a personal um, passion to the story in the documentary as well. Now, having having the inspiration and the excitement is how hard can this be, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Step one, 
is, is often the funding stage to get it off the ground. How hard was that? Yeah, so I, um, I began research after that. I had no idea about, like I had no idea about Roe v. Wade or how we actually got to this point. Like that was the looming question. How did we get to this point in our society of such contention over this topic? I didn't know the truth about pro, um, Planned Parenthood. Uh, and in the process of research, I discovered this multifaceted pro-life movement and all these stories. And just, I was researching and, and listening to podcasts and videos and just hearing the news about, uh, you know, abortion related things going on. And so uh, I started to compile the elements of all this research together and essentially forming an outline. And in this process, I was telling people about my idea and I spent a lot of time trying to sell people on the idea uh, in order to fundraise it for it. And that was, a, it took a lot of time to do that. So um, I, I sort of was trying to, um, trying to rally a bunch of money together in order to start and uh, I filmed a handful of interviews in the beginning by myself that I didn't end up using. I, um, like I said, I was evangelizing the project and I was attending and display and even displaying at these pro-life events to, with the purpose of selling people my idea or like making connections in the pro-life arena and um, just trying to get help as much as I could. Uh, it ended up being that the connections being made were the most valuable thing, by the way, but I'll talk more about that later. And I was looking for a crew at the same time. It was just me. <laughs> and uh, that was my first mistake, uh, being alone in this endeavor, pretty much. Um, but I, I searched for crew on Staff Me Up. I was looking for a producer that would be willing to, to embark on this. And I, I was looking on Staff Me Up, um, and I found... Brian Fellows, who's who ended up being an amazing producer for a part of this, and he works with Seth Haley, who's an amazing DP, and uh, so I hired them to help shoot what I thought was going to be something that was in the documentary, but didn't end up being in the documentary. It was great. It was such a huge, uh, excellent work. I, I I'm still very proud of it to this day. It's uh, called Penny Portrait of a Portrait of a Birth Mom, and uh, it's a short film about this mom who gives her son an, an adoption. And uh, so that was like a huge endeavor and just like a great filmmaking lesson for me. Just it was so much fun to work with a great crew. Anyway, I um, I was I fundraised for that, and it was sort of like a sort of like a a hard truth and a hard reality to deal with the fact later, later on down the road, when I got to the editing part and I realized this isn't fitting into the, into the documentary itself. And it felt like knives to my heart. Um, but yeah, it was like, a, it was definitely a great learning process. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a process of fundraising for that fundraising, right. like continuing to try to fundraise, for, uh, through doing um, GoFundMe. Okay. And I, in the beginning, I had a fiscal sponsor called From the Heart Productions. They ensured that donations could be tax deductible, but they also took a percentage of the, of the donations. Okay. So I left that and I just started using GoFundMe for a bit. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, I was met with a huge roadblock of fundraising. So I eventually formed, in 2020, I formed a nonprofit with the same name in order to, to finish it. Interesting. So, and I can go into that later, yeah. but yeah. So was it, it was primarily crowdfunded. Did you ever have any large sponsors or sources come along to invest or, or donate, so, whichever the case may be? So it was primarily in the beginning crowdfunded. I had some loyal donors nice. that really believed in the, in the vision. But then it became me working full time to fund to to shoot it, right. and I I was able 
at one at one point I was able to uh, live with my parents. Um, I moved back to San Diego where I'm from and uh, didn't have to pay rent for a time. So that allowed me to yeah. to travel and, and you know, um, to shoot and cover the costs for shooting. So it was a combination of donations and largely uh, at the end there, my own funds. Right. And then um, there was a huge, uh, some, somebody actually pushed me over the finish line at the end. And that's another, like, that's a huge uh, miracle. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. T taking taking personal sacrifice i'll put that in quotes a little bit but mm -hmm. uh to to get the project done that, that's mm -hmm. well done good job um i mean Thank not you. that crowdfunding and let, let somebody hear that and think yeah like, you can't crowdfund or whatever or take other things i'm not saying that but but willing yeah. to, to to take the step to yourself to then make sure it happens um sometimes what it takes so yeah great great work on that did you did you have distribution lined up when you started? At what point did, or I, I guess I should also ask, did you, do you have distribution? We're kind of, I'm kind of jumping bookends here because sometimes yeah. they kind of go hand in hand at the beginning. Sometimes distributors get involved and that helps. Sometimes you're making it and then hoping there's distribution. What was that path kind of like for you and how is that currently working? And then we'll come back and, and, and flesh out the middle. Yeah, so that was a huge learning process for me. Um, trying to think of how other or trying to learn how other filmmakers have done it what other filmmakers are doing how to best distribute this type of documentary and i i passed up the idea to do a fathom event for this like to do this special release because it was going to be a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars just to do that or something like i don't remember the budget exactly but i it was post covid when i was it was like during COVID, during right. the lockdown like fresh in it uh, while right. I was considering that. And the theater business was entirely different at that point. And right. so I thought, well, this isn't worth risking this much money on something that it's just a service that um, you might not get as much out as you put into or uh, mm -hmm. for just the climate that we're in and the subject matter of this project right so i decided to do really a largely grassroots effort um with wow. marketing just diy um, sure. essentially and i'm we're slowly we're kind of like a slow drip in releasing it to different to various platforms and like these events going on yeah um so we have a blu-ray copy of it that we're selling nice. at events Nice. We're, we have an October 1 or October 1st YouTube premiere uh, where people could watch it. It's going to be at the fe uh, film festival next week. Nice. And um, and after that, we're planning to put it on streaming. Nice. So through Film Hub, which is a service that I, it's an aggregator that I discovered, uh, you can submit your film and submit all the assets and the descriptions and everything. And essentially, this aggregator film hub, so, you know, pitches it to these various platforms. And uh, so, like, there's Christian Cinema, there's IMDb TV, there's Tubi TV, things like this. So, Amazon Prime isn't uh, allegedly isn't accepting unsolicited documentary content. So, Film Hub used to submit to Amazon Prime, but I guess maybe doesn't anymore. So you yeah. kind of like ne ne like Netflix, you have to have a connection right. in Amazon Prime. So that's a goal to to get a connection there mm -hmm. to submit to release on Amazon Prime. And you know, there's Vudu, right. uh, the Walmart one. So we want to we want to offer it in a lot of different ways. Right now, there uh, you can rent it on Vimeo okay. for nine ninety nine. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways you could see it. <laughs> But we're also trying to maintain, like, we're not advertising that outright yet. We're trying right. to maintain a little bit of exclusivity and anticipation. Right. So it's it's been a learning process of how to distribute sure. a movie like this. Sure. Yeah, I've heard I've heard rumor that Amazon is is changing up. They're currently in process of changing up the way they allow people to put outsiders to put stuff on their platform. Yeah. 
Um, they like aren't taking anything or something right now, even I, I'm not exactly on the distribution side, but I heard, I heard I was at NRB a couple of weeks ago and a lot of folks were talking about they're like, yeah, Amazon's out right now. You got to wait till the, they got a new website coming or something for mm -hmm. um, other content. And anyway, so yeah, are you, are you still looking for a con for a contact for Netflix or you say you, you do know some, somebody for that? Well, Netflix really isn't a priority for me. I don't sure. think with this, I mean, anything could happen. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised right. uh, if a miracle, I feel like it would be a miracle that it yeah. would get on Netflix right. because of the subject matter and the right. angle that it's, um, right. that it talks about it. Yeah. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would love to get on Netflix. I would yeah. love to have it on Netflix, but yeah. I'm not sure how that how that would look. So, are you on? Um, you're going to be at the film festival next week, right? Correct. Yeah. Cool. All right. What we'll to connect? I'm, I might know some yeah. people. Uh, what we'll to what we'll to check Rolodex and say? Do you know these people? You reached out to these people. Um, okay. I might be able to put you in touch with some people, or maybe you've already reached out to, them, but we can we can connect on that. So cool. great. Um. So once you get going, you start having some money come through. You start shooting some things. What was what was pre-production like in in producing a documentary, whether it's setting up interviews, um, planning? One of the big questions I often hear from documentaries: planning B-roll. What on earth are you going to put? Mm -hmm. Almost getting the interviews can sometimes be the easier part of it. What are you going to put on top of the interviews to help the audience feel entertained right. and keep their attention going? What was the pre-production and planning process like for you? Mm -hmm. Right, like I said, I compiled all the elements of research together and I really um, observed talking points of these different speakers and like people's unique stories. And I put it together in an out outline and the topics I wanted to cover, like the science of embryology, for instance, or the history of Roe v. Wade. And I put it together in an outline just thinking, well, uh, that's all I need is an outline. And then a colleague of mine said, oh, can I read your script? And I said, yeah. And I, you know, spent the next week writing a script. Um, and that was really helpful. <laughs> so with this type of, um, I feel like with this type of documentary, it's really useful and helpful and, and crucial to have a script like you would write a narrative right um so to connect the scenes together to connect the topics and the subject right. matter together <clears throat> to just write it as if you're writing this narrative like you're just visualizing each and every scene connecting together and so when you um, when you're writing out a documentary when you come to what do you do when it comes to interviews and you don't know exactly what they're going to say what did you do to yeah, fill well, so, those spaces so <clears throat> so i had the I, by the grace of god i really uh i used narration i used the narrative voice of god element um over this and so that really helped me connect and and just provide a story kind of a thing i um i was yeah i won't get into the editing part yet but mostly the speakers that i found that were the real building blocks of the documentary I already knew that they're, they're talking points. I already knew what they were saying in presentations <clears throat> and for, and then the bigger stories that I found, I already knew their story and how they told it. And so those weren't surprises. There were a lot of, of spontaneous things that we, of people that we found to, there was a couple uh, people that we found that were really spontaneous, but it ended up fitting right in like a puzzle uh and uh so it was just a combination of having to be flexible while you're planning i would say <laughs> yes <laughs> that, that definitely sounds As, like uh <clears throat> filmmaking but yeah but i i feel like there's a special element of flexibility with documentary because there's, there's just even <clears throat> if it's not a true discovery journey approach there's still an element of um what what will happen you know and and like i say you're finding new things and, and that can happen on the narrative side as well in some cases but um the a documentary is as much as we try to script it there's so much reworking of that script I, in my experience there's a little bit more reworking of a script than there is in a narrative side um right. anyway but 
Right. Um, so how did you how did you end up filming? Were you did you like block a month and just travel around and shoot all these interviews? Did you kind of do it on weekends and, and pick it up over time? How, how did the filming part of it go? Yeah, kind of a combination. I like I said, the idea struck me in uh, 2016 and I didn't start officially filming until the end for the documentary until the end of 2018. And uh, all that time, it's just looming over me, like in the back of my mind, it's the idea is still there. The vision is still there, you know? Um, so I, um, it was a combination of either just me and my, myself and a camera or me and my friend, Tim, who I met at working at Rock Church full time. Um, he was a volunteer for this project. He heard the, he helped me, he helped me shoot a, um, I'll get into the story. So I was working at Rock Church full time as an editor. And I still with this documentary just needing to happen, <laughs> but just editing all day. And uh, I asked my friend Tim who worked there, who was shooting a lot for The Rock, I um, I asked him to help turn on the camera so I could speak to the teleprompter and pitch the documentary idea because I was trying I was still trying to get it off the ground even in, I think it was 2017 at that point and um, I put all like I didn't tell him what the subject matter was because uh, I'm always even at a church I'm like never sure what people's beliefs are and don't want to <laughs> I just want this person to help me so <laughs> come into the studio. <laughs> anyway, so I was reading the teleprompter, and as we started, and I said the word, you know, I said this is a pro-life documentary idea, I felt like there was this heavy sigh behind the camera from Tim, and I go, oh God, he's not supportive, oh gosh, let's just get through this, <laughs> and uh, so I, you know, midway through, he stopped the camera, and he goes, Tracy, I just have to tell you, I've always thought this should be a documentary. I wanted to help you. So Tim helped me shoot this. We went out in several places across the country uh, shooting this. Uh, he shot most of the B-roll and most of the interviews. Like it was just total miracle. So. Wow. I, uh, yeah, I didn't have to pay for, I just paid for his meals and his lodging and flights, but I didn't have to pay his, uh, like he was volunteering right. and then be before around the same time at like beginning in 28 or October 2018 I um, did hire Brian and Seth again they're in the Chicago area and we right. just flew every we we flew all the interviewees to this central area in Chicago we rented out a peer space uh, we shot with reds it was it was great and um, just uh, it was really fundamental to knock that handful of interviews over a couple of days out of the right. way it was the wow. same setup the same angles sure we just uh, uh budget allotted we just uh it was i think four people on set <laughs> or on right. crew uh including me and uh, the pa yeah and um we just knocked out these interviews and that helped me to start editing sure um and yeah uh tim and i then later later uh, like a month later went to drove to phoenix filmed a, a large part of it there as well uh, this uh, man's story so yeah oh and um also rock church provided the camera <laughs> to borrow so i didn't have to rent a camera i just used their c c200 nice um, to shoot that to shoot our part of it so yeah yeah it was it was really just uh, it was really just working full time shooting on the weekends. Uh, there was a there was a point though where I left the full time. I was just like I I really have to leave guys. I need to I need to really start doing this right. documentary full time. And I did. I left the full time job at Rock Church and uh, but I still got some freelance projects coming in. <laughs> including one from rock church when it when easter hit and the lockdown crisis was happening like all of a sudden i was editing overnight you know editing for easter and just um editing again but um that was great because i that was more money for me to 
to fund the project. So had you yeah. had you conducted interviews and directed interviews before? I mean, you talk about doing editing on the on the back end side of of documentary stuff, but had you had you sat down in a chair and actually done interviews or was that new for you? Um, I had done interviews before. I um like I said, I did promo videos for these organizations and nonprofits. And so that helped me. Sure. Being an editor of documentaries for a long time really just gives you that intuition in the filming process of, of knowing you're just sort of editing as they're, <clears throat> you're just being an editor as they're talking. Right. Um, so yeah, I, but I think what was really helpful for me in the interviews for this was knowing what content I, content I wanted from each person mm -hmm. instead of like, oh, tell me, like, tell me about abort, like, tell me why you're pro-life, right? You know, just, I was really prepared for these interviews. Um, sometimes I didn't know what I needed. Like, it just was like, I don't know where, you know, in the interview process itself, I'm like, I'm just going to let them do their thing. I need to improvise, improvise a little bit here. Yeah but you go in right. being really prepared, so. Right, and how did you prepare? What, what were some of those things that you prepared for the interviews? Yeah, I just thought of questions that would, would generate that content that I needed. Right. Like I said, this is, I used primarily people that I already knew their talking points yep. and um, knew exactly verbatim what they say usually. Right. They're professional speakers, a lot of them. Um, with, so it was very helpful now that I think about it to have the audience in mind and the audience I'm reaching with this documentary is somebody who is, has no idea about abortion, like the abortion issue in the United States, how we got here, the truth, Roe v. Wade. So I always had an audience that was clueless in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not preaching to the choir with this movie. It's a social commentary, um, and it's it's really helping an audience that's maybe on the fence, not really sure what they believe about it. And so there was one interview, or one or two, where I was interviewing attorneys, and I was trying to get them to tell the story of Roe v. Wade in a way that made sense, <laughs> uh, like from the Constitution point of view. Like you really, I really had to go back to fundamentals of what it means in the constitution, like what Roe v. Wade actually did, um, and how it's how it was very uh, carved out of whole cloth, like the whole decision in Roe v. Wade, and how it's not constitutional. And just I had to really like break it down for an audience that really doesn't care about politics, doesn't care about or doesn't, doesn't really know a whole lot about government or how the law works or our rights or, you know, the constitution. Right. So, um, that was, a ch that was sort of a challenge and a, a back and forth of trying to like of get the information from them that I needed without really knowing how to do that. So, um, yeah, editing really helped. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So moving, moving from there into the post-production side, there's often a lot of editing that can go on in, in documentary. From all the planning and thoughts and interviews you did, how did that end up going for you in the editing phase? Did it, did it fit according to your script or was there a lot of, um, I don't want to say trial and error because it's more about just like shuffling puzzle pieces to figure out which pieces connect best. Uh, an error, I feel like, is a little bit too strong of a word in, in an editing a documentary a lot of times, but it's, uh, what was that process like for you? Yeah, so, well, I, I'd like to say that the final product as it is right, as it is today, is export number 53, so version 53, you can imagine. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's a lot or not enough, I don't know, but uh, so For a feature length project that, that sounds, yeah, that, that's not un yeah. <laughs> unheard of. Yeah. There's so many details that go into it. So, um, uh, so it really came together. Just some highlights for me were that it, it was a clunky start a little bit as 
it always is with <laughs> starting an edit very tough um but more and more i saw it come together and uh it almost in, it sort of informed what i started like it, it informed the footage that i still needed um so what happened was i prepped and organized like i usually would a project and you know making multi cams laying out the interview questions organizing the heck out of everything i mean that's a whole nother podcast but um you know i trans especially for a documentary like this one with all the talking i transcribed all the interviews using a plugin for premiere called transcriptive and um that was huge hugely beneficial in shaping the story and then i started a content cut which is broad brushstrokes just building an outline of the footage like here's where just the building blocks and not getting too cutty um and then trying to build the connections between the scenes somehow and that's where narr narration like the temp narration really came in handy so um i mean i didn't do i did it a really uh <laughs> sloppy i sloppily um recorded my voice on my phone drop air dropped it onto the timeline re you know rewrote it re-recorded like there was just back and forth while i was editing of me recording my own voice for the narration um so that was kind of that was sort of a fun process actually and um it took a lot of time to really get it to where it needed to be before like i i waited one of the last things i did was record the final voice like the per the talent that i found and um so uh so as i was editing this content cut this rough cut i was um showing it to friends and family members and uh their opinions and their feedback even subtle reactions i would watch for their reactions i really wanted to pay attention to what wor was working and what wasn't with the story and even like one sentence would confuse people or a word would throw people off and so i paid attention to those things um and then i was ripping a lot of of clips off of youtube to like put in there to tell the story um like if somebody's referencing something in the media i'll have a media clip and so i was researching and pulling a bunch of stuff off of youtube with clip grab and then i started to use stock footage um for kind of temp b-roll and um temp b-roll of what i needed but also uh, also it ended up being that i bought some some uh, stock footage and used it so i i compiled uh, a document of b-roll like i just listed my wish list of b-roll and uh put it in the so in a row like an association with what was being said in the interview so i can actually pull up the document right now if you want to screen yeah, share cool. yeah can you see i think it's oh, just wait. it's just loading in yeah, there, there we go, go. yep so go. so yeah this is pre-production script by the way uh it ended up being extremely different from all this, but this is sort of what it looks like. It's just very much like a, oh, I, I had written chapters for it in the beginning. And then, um, so this is, so I compiled a B-roll shot list after I had pretty much a rough cut laid out and everything. It was like, okay, I need, I need this to tell this scene. I need this right. for this sentence very, very detailed of each sentence. Right. Like I had in mind graphics, I had in mind everything I needed. I was just sort of like watching the film in my head, sort of, so to yeah. speak. Um, I'm like, oh, I would, it would be great to have a girl here right. doing this. I didn't want it to be talking heads as much as possible. Yeah. Um, this shot right here ended up being my, like my sister driving her car. <laughs> um, we, me and Tim stopped, like made a pit stop at the Mississippi River, shot the river. Um, this was, this is something I bought. <laughs> I needed a couple arguing, you know. Right. This ended up being, 
I ended up replacing this with my niece and her okay. dog. And uh, just like things like that, where I just knew this, I bought, you know, this, right. this kind of thing. Anyway. That's fantastic. So, and you can even, you can even yeah. like scroll through it in a sense. It's almost like a mood board for the documentary. And yeah. You see it, feel it, see if it's matching. You can, you can see the story. Right, right, right. right. Um, and then in a spreadsheet format, you can keep track of what's done, what's not, you know, and, and keep up exactly. with it. Exactly. Yeah. No. Exactly. At what point so, yeah. did you put this together? Was this um, was this kind of what did you make that document before you actually had gone and shot anything, and this was completely in pre-production, or was this once you had like a rough cut of interviews, then you kind of went in and, and made that document? If that makes sense. It was after the rough cut of interviews. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because then I knew for sure what I needed, and um, so that was a really fun process of of telling the story visually. And I was just very dead set on <laughs> using B-roll and making it really visual. So um, yeah, that was definitely, you had to definitely have the building blocks of pe what people were saying first. Right. So talk to me a little bit more. I'm going to, I want to dig into the B-roll here a little bit because it's just one of the biggest, one of the biggest parts of a documentary because it's, it's one of the biggest differentiators from, from narrative is having this other footage that you have to somehow <laughs> find and collect right. to, uh, to, to make it visually interesting. So using media clips and, and then with documentary, there's also the issue of fair use. And then like, what can you use? Yeah. What can you go film in public? What do you have to get permissions for? Um, and that can get all kinds of fun and tricky. Uh, so for, yeah. for your project, uh, talk to me a little bit more about the, the media clips. Do you, how'd you go about deciding what to use, how to alter it, how to credit it? Um, yeah. And then obviously you bought some of the stock footage <clears throat> so that just solves that one. Um, right. Then, then filming, because I was looking, even looking through the trailer, like you have some, like there's there's a lot of um, uh, protests maybe. It's it's like large crowds of people with signs or it's, it's fantastic footage. It was all that stuff mm -hmm. part of the stock footage thing or did you guys go attend some of those events and film yeah. footage? And then how did you decide to use yeah. it? Talk to me about some of the, the usage. And how you you yeah the for sure for sure the protest footage was largely in person we shot those um, we went to walk for life uh, in San I think Francisco this is the battleground culture walk issue in America in DC um, that kind of thing uh, so we had some great content from that so the licensing. Um, was a huge roadblock and a learning process for me. I had no idea what I was doing. I, um, you know, I was just hoping and praying for somebody to help me do that, but I was willing to DIY that myself as well, even though it was sort of like navigating in the dark. I, so I wasn't even looking for a person to help, like an archivist, archival producer, but I, Ended up, I went to Hollywood to visit um, family theater productions. I bought coffee for the studio there and because I, I wanted to talk to my friend Megan Harrington, who's a producer there, just to pick her brain and get her advice about how to fundraise and how I could possibly finish this movie. I just sort of wanted her wisdom and to just glean off of her. Um, and I showed her like the budget and the breakdown and what my plan was and it was a really big number that I needed. And so uh, we didn't really talk a, a whole lot about donors or funders or backers or anything like that. Um, she was she was just really helpful overall in um, just telling me about her, a little about her experience with documentary. But one thing she gave me that, that was gold was a name of another person named Megan, who uh, is a archival uh, archival producer so she deals with clips all day long she's in contact with um people that sell the clips and just like archival archivists and uh, archival houses and she has contacts at getty and contacts at you know pond five and um and film supply and things like this she's already doing it uh as her job and she's able to bring the prices down and things like this and able to know what spreadsheet like spreadsheet workflows and things like that 
that was just amazing. That was just a <laughs> that's a fine turning point for me. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's a find. I wasn't looking for it. I didn't realize how much I needed it. <laughs> oh my she goodness! Saved me so she saved me so much money, and then she brought on somebody who she works with, who's an attorney, Lincoln Banlow, who does primarily um, fair use. Yes. Uh, fair use clip. Like he analyzes your project. He watches it. He, he um, breaks down this spreadsheet. Like he, he checks off if it's fair yeah. use or not. Wow. And that's sort of like a attorney's intuition usually, but it's it, like, you have to know what, like if, right. if it's, if the clip is talking about what the person is, if the person in the documentary is saying, like if the clip illustrates directly what the person is saying or what the right you know the person in the documentary is saying then it's fair use mm -hmm. um and so so she connected me to lincoln so th these two people were <laughs> swooped in and provided what i needed so wow. it was great um yeah and um and so but i was working off of these watermarked clips for right. quite a while right um and uh, because they were they were expensive to right. license it worldwide to the terms that I wanted worldwide, uh, forever, you know, perpetual, yep. um, uh, and over the o OTT, yep. um, right. So, yep. so th those were expensive. And so I, that was, that was a huge chunk of money that I needed, <laughs> but that's a whole other, like so I had some do? angel donors that came okay. in. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. um, so I started, so I was editing, this rough cut with, or the, you know, what was becoming more and more of a, of a finished piece as I went. Um, I will go into MoGraph as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I, in the beginning, I had this on my budget. I, I had this chunk of money reserved for whoever the MoGraph person, her, whoever the motion graphics person was going to be. And um, you know, as I learned that. Uh, as I learned to just do it, my do things myself, um, and not wait, <laughs> not wait. Um, I just decided to do the mo graph myself. And which so, and which um, part of the motion graphics are you talking about? Like mo sometimes motion graphics are like charts or yeah. like text on slides. In the trailer, you also have some animation. So the animator I found through my friend Aaron. Okay who also connected me with Megan, but Aaron introduced me to, I was asking people, like I was, at, I asked Aaron if she, cause she's pro-life, she's Catholic, she's, she's in film and stuff like right. this. Do you know anyone who would be interested in this project? Who's an animator? And she's like, actually, yeah, I do. So that ended up being Chris, <laughs> Christoph, Christoph, phenomenal, uh, just to work with. And, um, just created these amazing animations that were the yeah. actual animations that were cartoons, you know? Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so that was just, yeah. And I was um, just so privileged to, to be connected to these connections. And, um, but the MoGraph itself, I, I just decided to do myself and it really threw me into a deeper level of After Effects that I was so, uh, it was so fun it was great it was my one of my favorite parts was doing the after effects sequences yeah. for this uh, it was such a huge learning process and such a blessing yeah. um to do that myself versus pay somebody else i actually i think i have uh i think i have a list of all the mo yeah here we go i'll screen share once again okay. So at one point I had to have a heart to heart with like a heart to heart with myself and um, list out all the graphic sequences that I needed to do and how many hours it was going to take me um, just to kind of face reality a little bit. Let's see. Uh, share screen. <clears throat> and uh, so, yeah. Um, this is sort of the breakdown. All this, all this became After Effects. So they're all sequences. subtitles of some sort. They're all clips. Like oh, this see. clip needs this clip. This clip needs After Effects, essentially. Like, 
so as much as possible, by the way, I um, separated After Effects projects. So I didn't right. have like one huge yeah. After Effects project sure. for this, pro you know, for the documentary. I had right. multiple, multiple, multiple After Effects projects, not right. just sequences, but projects. So, right. Um, you, so that just begs the question of in Premiere, did you have one stand? I'm assuming you use Premiere, but did you use one standalone project for that or did you break it up into separate projects? No, I had one standalone okay. um, project for that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I mean, I think it, every time every time Premiere crashed, I would save a version of it, obviously. Right. But right. so um, yeah, I had backups. So of course. Good, good for you. Yes, that's a good, <laughs> good editor note right there. Yeah, backups, of course. Yes. Um, so yeah, we're we're starting to get close on some time here. We're gonna yeah. jump towards what's some of the response been? I know you're still kind of waiting for some of like you've had a premiere and you've had some of the other online stuff. You're you're still pushing towards um, some of the release and and things that are coming, but you've already shown to some audiences outside of your test group or your feedback group. What's some of the, what are some of the feedback and responses you're getting so far? Yeah. Um, positive so far. Um, I, people are really responsive and they, they really genuinely are inspired when they watch it. They're in edified and enlightened. They're educated, uh, which is what really where it starts when you get involved in pro-life and it's really where my journey started was being educated. So um, people are fired up and they're, they're just, they're completely convinced that this is, uh, you know, of, they're completely convinced that abortion is wrong, which is what I was going for. <laughs> and um, so one example, I, I did show the rough cut to some of my pro-choice leaning friends okay uh early on and um even in a rough cut stage with my my voice as the narrator and everything i uh converted some people to, to being pro-life so that was cool <laughs> wow. wow um yeah yeah um so yeah it's just really not a topic that people think about or talk about it's really taboo even in churches they don't want to they don't even go there. It's just too political, too sensitive and personal. So um, I, I, this film has been turning into a tool that really opens up the conversation and even uh, allows people to start their healing journey if they've mm. gone through an abortion in their past. Oh wow! Um, so the the I wanted the tone to not be preaching to the choir. Like I said, I wanted to it to be. Um, helping people understand, but not demonizing the opposing side, uh, really coming from a place of empathy and helping people understand the issue. So yeah. I think people really feel that when they watch it. Yeah. Are there any stories or topics that uh, I know there's so many in making a documentary? Um, I've, anyway, I've been on both sides of that as well. And it's, uh, is there anything that you want to share that I've missed or that stands out? Um, are you talking about stories that any are were included away, in the movie? Yeah, yeah. Any? Um, okay. I didn't know we where there's been multiple times where we say, "Well, well, maybe we'll get to that one. Maybe we'll get to that." And we keep moving on. Maybe oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. know if there's any of those that really stand out that you're yeah. like, "Yeah, I really want to share this with." with an audience that's maybe mm -hmm. looking at starting their own documentary or in the middle of a documentary, um, mm -hmm. anything, anything from your journey that, that would, that you want to share that I've missed. Yeah. So, right, right, right. Well, to the indie filmmakers out there, I just want to say filmmaking requires relationships and lots of connections. And I know we say that a lot in the film industry. It's very cliche to say, <laughs> it's all who you know, but it really is. And I, yeah. it, as an introvert, I had to learn that a lot the hard way. Um, and it, and, um, it doesn't matter if it's a $20 million project or, you know, $2,000 project. It's really about who, you know, in it and, uh, the connections that you make like a film, I, I believe is made up of people that connect you to people that connect you to people. And, um, so one story I will leave with you is the story of my angel donor. So. I 
was at a po breaking point or at a wall where I didn't have the fund, like this huge chunk of money. And uh, in desperation, my mom and I wrote, typed out a prayer asking God for this sum of money. <laughs> and I hung it on the wall and we both signed it. And a, a few months later where I wasn't even seeking, I wasn't even trying to contact people for help or trying to donate. Um, my friend from Bible study, she texted me and she said, my brother-in-law wants to talk to you, wants to have coffee. Uh, Cause I guess he's, he has his own production stuff going on as well. And the abortion topic kind of struck him and his wife recently. And um, so we eventually uh, had coffee and he introduced me to uh, these, this amazing couple um, that ended up watching the rough cut themselves. And I eventually got on the phone with them and uh, they asked all these, uh, he asked all these kinds of questions about uh, my heart and just the journey and just the, the vision. I didn't even have to ask for the, <laughs> for the donation or ask for the money. I actually got off the phone after a great conversation, got off the phone and I was like, oh, is he going to, I don't know if he's going to, do I, I guess he's not going to donate. And then about half an hour later, he calls back and says, um, we both prayed about this number and it was the same number. Wow. And it was a hundred, it was a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> and so that pushed me over the finish line that allowed me to buy all yeah. the clips that I needed that allowed me to pay the amazing composer that yeah. was, um, and that allowed me to, to really still have a cushion of savings to be able to sure. work full time on this and promote it and, um, and just, uh, cover the costs that that come up as I start promoting this so wow yeah it was wow what an answer to prayer <laughs> that's amazing yeah <laughs> so so long story short go to bible study <laughs> go to bible keep, study and build relationships keep going to bible study yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean it really yeah and i wasn't even trying like i said right. so if well and that's uh, and, and I, that's often yeah. where some of those things come is is when you're you, I mean, you in a general sense, you're passionate, you're, you're building relationships, but when you're more interested in other people and helping other people, um, right. I think other people can see that when they align with those values and what you're pushing towards, they want to come alongside and help you. It's not about you. They can tell it's not about you. It's about helping other people. And that's part of the exactly. building relationships. You have to be able to, exactly. um, you're building relationships for the relationship to help each other, not so you can necessarily just get something from them. And that's, People can tell people, we, people can sense that in other people. All right. Last question. If you could, you, you said at the beginning, your, one of your, your first questions was how hard can this be? Now that you've, <laughs> now that you're on this end of it, if you could go back and give yourself like one or two pieces of advice, what would you say to yourself starting out with the knowledge you have now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, well, I was privileged to have real certainty about the vision. And so I had that. I feel like that really helped me get through this was that I was willing to live with this idea. I believed in it so strongly that I was willing to live with it for three years and it would still, it wouldn't leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't an option to give up that that's how strongly I believed in it. And that's what I would say to other filmmakers if or indie filmmakers, if they, if they have a vision, make sure you, you believe in it so much and that it's, a very marketable, valuable product and great idea, so much that you are willing to live with it for minimum three three years. Right. Um, I would say to my earlier, my slightly younger self, um, use the existing resources that you have in your hand. Uh, that's something that I learned later on in the project. Uh, was instead of waiting for perfect circum for perfect circumstances, waiting for someone bigger than you to green light the project. I reached out to a lot of organizations in the beginning that didn't want to, that didn't want, to, I, I was an obscure right. person. Nobody yep. knew who I was. And this is a very contentious topic and yep. people don't want to take that risk understandably. And um, so that was kind of like crazy in itself, but um, you, who do I know right now mm -hmm. um, who, who can help me right now? So um, that was, I had to trust that the five loaves and two fish, so to speak, was going to be multiplied. Uh, and it was. Yeah. Wow. 
what 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 a journey and again i i applaud you for for sticking with it uh for living with it to use your words for three years and and bring it to completion and and i love being able to look back and see god's hand in it as well and in making connections and bringing investment and and helping push this through um, I hope it continues to go on and, and impact and encourage and challenge uh, in a good way even more people. Real quick, where can people find you and find the film? Yeah, you can visit matteroflife.org to learn more, watch the trailer, and uh, you can follow Matter of Life on Instagram. We have the Matter of Life on Instagram. We have an October 1 YouTube premiere coming up that we're trying to promote, so yes. stay tuned. Nice. All right. Very good. Thanks for joining Stacy or Stacy Tracy. It happens all the time. <laughs> like yeah, I mean, like we, at the beginning we were going to like make sure Stacy and Tracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Too similar. Yeah, no. Th thanks again, Tracy, for, for coming on. And uh, yeah, it's um, it, it's really fun to kind of hear some of those kind of behind the scenes looks at projects and things. I think a lot of times all people see is the tip of the iceberg. It's like, oh, you just went and made a feature length right. documentary. How hard right. can that be? <laughs> How hard can that be, right? And, How uh, hard can this be? <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I appreciate you sharing kind of the journey and kind of look at, especially kind of your pre-production process and all that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so we're excited to see it. I haven't seen the documentary yet. And I'm, I know it's, it's showing at the film festival next week or I guess it's next week. We leave this weekend. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, Already here. Yeah, it's crazy. So, um, but yeah, thanks again for sharing. And um, again, if you guys didn't catch that, the the link to go see the trailer, and, and I think you can watch it online if I, uh, through Vimeo On Demand, um, go to uh, matteroflife.org, and you can follow on, on Instagram and, and Facebook, things like that. Um, but yeah, so anyways, uh, as we head out here, um, just want to remind you guys that um, we also have a Facebook group. So and I know Tracy's in the Facebook group, um, so I'm guessing she'd be happy to answer questions for you guys. Uh, so if you want to join the Facebook group, it's um, the Film Career group on Facebook. I just posted a link in the chat there, um, and so that can be helpful. Just if you guys have additional questions, things like that, go ahead and do there. Feel free to interact with the comments as well uh, once this recording is posted. Um, and also, if you're not subscribed, uh, we have a lot more of this type of content coming up soon, so you can join us there. Um, but yeah, as we head out, <clears throat> just a reminder, do work show work and network and we will see you guys uh back here once again very soon so thanks for joining us guys and we will talk soon all right and uh talk to you soon